Church of the United, United States, States of America, America and through the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. So starting tonight's proceedings, I'll ask the Secretary to call the roll, please. Gladly. Starting out, President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstamp. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Member McFarland. Absent. Member Singer. Here. And uh, for public consumption, Member McFarland, I think, got what I had last week <laughs> and that Mike is proceeding to get. So uh, avoid us. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's got a chair I'm in between them. Right? Trying to avoid <laughs> people for the last week. So. Um, now we'll move into the consent agenda. There's only a few items on the consent agenda this evening. Uh, last mini, last meeting minutes, um, the a few uh, resignations of paraprofessionals and uh, relatively small legal bills. Uh, any additions or deletions requested for the consent agenda? Just to clarify one thing, it's not just the last uh, meeting, but also the special meetings. The special for the, meetings for the, for the strategic planning. Thank you. <coughs> um, and yet, thank you for the clarification. Any other clarifications, ads, or deletes? See none, I'll entertain a motion. I move we accept consent agenda, consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.3. Second. Support. That's good. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> moved by Treasurer Branson, <laughs> support by, by Member Gordon. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. At this point, we move into requests to address the board. We have no formal requests this evening. Anybody in the audience uh, care to address the board this evening on any issues? And if you do, uh, state your attendance at your name, your address, and your attendance, school attendance area. And, uh, yeah, just come to the yeah, just come to the mic. Cindy will turn it on. Don't don't be intimidated. <laughs> <You don't intimidate. laughs> um, my name is Nikki Smith, and what what all did I have to list? I'm sorry. What is address? Address. Address two one two six West Gordonville Road, Midland. Thank you. And. My school attendance area is not Midland. Do you ah. still want to know it? <laughs> okay. No, that's good. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> we'll do the math. <laughs> okay. um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank the um, IB art students. I'm the executive director at Safe and Sound Child Advocacy Center, and we recently, well, last Friday, held our first annual um, art and advocacy auction event, and we raised $5,000. And the IB students donated their art and their time when they heard what our mission was to prevent child abuse and neglect, they jumped on board. And we're just, their work was outstanding. And I just wanted to take a moment to say, to thank them for that. Well, Very nice. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for affording the opportunity. Anyone else care to address the board? <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to Board of Education, our matters, and we'll move into Mr. Sherrill. We have our shining star employees that we'd like to honor, and the first one we'd like to honor tonight, please come up, is Verita. Verita's here. <laughs> Verita Hayes Cloyd. Yeah. Make sure I say it right. Verita began her career with Midland Public Schools in August of 1979 as a member of the special education staff for Midland Public Schools. Her career began in the TMI, Trainable Mentally Impaired Classroom at Ashman School. Ms. Hayes Cloyd earned her bachelor's degree from Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina with a special education major in 1979 and completed her Master of Arts degree in General Education Administration from Central Michigan University in 1992. In the 1985-86 school year, Verita moved from Ashman School to the TMI program at Midland High School. Then in 1997-98 school year, Verita moved to the Dow High School TMI program. She continues to work with special needs students at HH Dow High School today. Ms. Hayes Cloyd is a consummate professional with more than 34 ded dedicated years of service to the Midland Public Schools, students, family, staff, and community. She does an amazing job assessing community and district resources to bring incredible opportunities to her students. She continues to collaborate with community agencies providing a valued service and presenting Dow High and Midland Public Schools in a very positive light. Rita is a truly valued member of the Special Services, Dow High, and Midland Public Schools family. Frida was nominated for the Shining Star Award by an MPF's colleague, 
the staff member wrote, in the midst of our challenges with power outages and snow days, Rita maintained her annual commitment to the Salvation RV in Midland by delivering 12 prepared turkeys for their Thanksgiving feast. Wow. <laughs> in order to accomplish this, Rita spent several evenings in the Dow High kitchen cooking the dozen turkeys so students in her food service classes could debone and bag the birds. She then delivered them to Salvation Army on time. Rita has worked in collaboration with the Salvation Army each year since she took over the food service class, but meeting the challenges here was particularly difficult. Congratulations to Rita. next shining star we have three of them it's kind of unusual that we do this but um, this one was a, a, a nomination for all three of them because of something they particularly they had done so I'm gonna read a little and one of them is not here tonight but I'll read all three of them and then uh, close with a statement as well our first uh, one is Rita Klump Rita began her employment with Midland Public Schools in August of 1996 as an office technical professional in the Human Resources Office at the Administration Center she is in her 10th year in her current position as administrative assistant to the associate superintendent of curriculum. Rita is truly a shining star for our district. Just last year she was nominated for and received the 2012 Distinguished Service Award, which is given to non-teaching staff members who go above and beyond in all that they do to make Midland Public Schools a better place. Rita is organized, resourceful, and professional. Besides her amazing work ethic and, and technical skills, she has a wonderful sense of humor and an infectious smile both of which she shares readily, brightening the workplace of, of those around her. And Kathy Janicek. Kathy has held her current position of the Science Resource Center manager since June of 2004 when she joined the Midland Public Schools family. Before coming to Midland Public Schools, Kathy worked for the Bay City Schools and the Dow Chemical Company. Kathy holds a bachelor's degree in agronomy, they said that right? And soils from Clemson University. In her role as a Science Resource Center, ma Center Manager, Kathy oversees, manages, organizes, purchases, and distributes all aspects of the grade level science kits. In addition, she does SRC staff supervision and training, workshop coordination, and provides teacher support. Kathy is a member of the District Safety Committee, coordinates hazardous waste pickup disposal, and monitors science lab safety. Kathy is a vital member of the MPS team is invaluable in her science resource role for the Midland Public Schools. And the third member we're honoring tonight, not here, is Jeff Hayes. Jeff has held his current position for Central's Auditorium Manager for the past 15 years. He joined the MPS family in May of 1999. With the changes in the status of Central this year, Mr. Hayes' position has also changed. He will continue to do an amazing job for us at Central Auditorium Manager. However, in addition, Mr. Hayes now oversees the administration and management of the entire Central building. The building is in the site of many day and evening events. Mr. Hayes handles the reservations and rentals for the entire building. Mr. Hayes works with many different people in his role and is able to effectively juggle the schedules and requests that he receives. He takes great pride in his work and in Central Auditorium and building. And I think what's so unusual is all three of them do different things, but this is why they're being honored tonight. <coughs> These three MPS family me members were nominated for the Shining Star Award by the MPS colleague. Among her comments, the staff members wrote, when the art department moved from Central to Northeast in Jefferson, they left behind close to 200 old containers of flammable or hazardous materials that weren't needed elsewhere in the district. Jeff Hayes located and consolidated all of the containers in a single location. Kathy Anacek and Rita Klump then spent many hours one afternoon creating an inventory of the materials and boxing them for re relocation to a special cabinet where flammable materials can be safely stored until proper disposal can take place. Although this project isn't part of their job responsibilities of any of the three, they all stepped and offered their expertise to make Central a safe building. Congratulations, Rita, Kathy, and Jeff. Thank you. Thanks 
see you all the time. Thank you for all your help, Rita. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Um, but this, as I mentioned, was a learning curve. So we were learning beside each other, beside our students, teaching one another, learning from one another. So it's been a great learning process. Frequency and mobility. In the past, kindergarten children had the opportunity to have an individual technology time once a week. And at Woodcrest, it's the form of a computer, a mobile computer lab. And if you have ever visited an elementary school during computer lab time, it's really tricky getting everybody up and running. And so that takes a great deal of teacher instruction is just to have the children log on to the laptops, to access the website or the program that we um, were intended. So a lot of our instruction was step by step and children didn't have as much time to actually interact, interact with the technology. So this has been a great shift for us because we have iPads at our fingertips. It's are easily and readily available for us to use throughout the day at any time. A great feature of the iPad, it's very mobile. We don't, we can, anywhere in our classroom is a great spot to work on an iPad. So it opens up some great um, opportunities for us. As I mentioned, we have lots of wonderful apps that were specifically written for um, educational purposes. So we have a great deal of apps out there that really um, support our kindergarten curriculum and give students opportunities to practice what we're teaching. Um, also, it's easy for us as teachers to, to load or to save websites on our children's home screens and they can easily, with the touch of the finger, be at a website that we want them to be at. We are always looking for new and creative methods and this technology really helped us to move in that direction and it totally has changed the approach to the way to our instruction and the approach to the way students are learning. Increased in creative communication, we have been Really, one of the features of the iPad is that we can videotape the children in action. We can take their photos. We can email these to parents. And it's a much more creative way of getting the little glimpse of their child's day at school. In the past, our children did not access their email accounts. And with the iPad, it's very easy. It's on the home screen. They can touch that envelope and be in their email. So our communication with students has definitely increased. Home to school, currently, our kindergarten children take their iPads home once a week. And we have shifted some of our home assignments to digital assignments. So for instance, if children are learning, writing a story at school on, on one of our apps, we can assign a similar story at home. And so we feel that our assignments at home are very appropriate and meaningful, and they're also getting <coughs> practice at what we have been working on at school. Managing student work and with differing abilities in a classroom, as in any classroom, the kindergarten classroom has a full range of abilities. And so as I mentioned, there are numerous apps that support our curriculum. And um, in a, in a, it's very simple for us as teachers to have students working on various apps at the same time. So one child, for instance, may need to have extra letter and sound support. Another child may need to work on building words. And another child may be writing a story. And all the children can be working on it. It's very manageable for a teacher um, to help, their, help meet the needs of each individual in our classroom. So we feel these are some ways that technology has impacted our teaching um, this over the past year. Yeah, I'll talk about how have the iPads impacted students. If you've ever been in a kindergarten classroom, um, especially with the mobile lab cart, and you have these laptops, and 25 of them, you have 45 minutes to unload all the laptops, get them set up, and then, oh yeah, you need to log them all in before you can do a lesson. Um, so by the time you get them all unloaded, set up, and the kids are trying to be quiet while you're doing all of this. And um, you get them set in the website that you want to show them or the, the um, tool that you want to show them. You have about 15 minutes because it's going to take another 15 to put them all away. <laughs> so you know that these iPads are totally a 
um, appropriate tool for a kindergarten. Um, and it is their world. They come from homes with iPads or iPhones. They knew more about the iPads than we did. <laughs> when I presented this at the dinner table to my children, they're like, Mom, how are you going to teach them? <laughs> what are you going to teach them? You don't even know what an app is. But guess what? They taught us, and they know a lot. This is such an appropriate tool for them. Um, it's a great carryover from home. They can communicate quite easily. They know how to use email. They know how to videotape someone and share that information. It's also high interest. These kids are excited and enthusiastic. iPads provide a variety of ways to get at things. Not just paper, pencil all the time, but different ways to get it different ideas. It's been very exciting to watch them come up with their own ideas of how to do things. They're great problem solvers, great thinkers, and they share that readily. It also provides that immediate feedback that five and six-year-olds need. Well, adults need that too, but <laughs> um, five and six-year-olds especially. It's great. It keeps them on task, keeps them focused. Um, the other part that we really like is everybody's successful. No matter if you're just learning your letters or if you're already writing stories. For example, when you think about a kindergartner writing a story, they have to learn how to, they have to know how to hold the pencil. They have to know what, how to form the letter. They have to know the letters. They have to be able to draw the picture. With an iPad, the, the pressure of that fine motor is taken away. They have the content. They have such, I have a great thinker in my room. He cannot hold the pencil, but he is a great thinker and can communicate those ideas on the iPad. What a great gift to him. And also that leads us into the next point where it provides great repetition in different ways and differentiation. Like Lynn mentioned, <laughs> kids who are starting with letter recognition can work on certain apps, why the child who's writing a story can get into the Story Buddy app and write a story. Um, one thing that's great and we've mentioned time again is that side-by-side -side collaboration where children will share ideas back and forth. And that's a very exciting thing in kindergarten. You can see that as they get older, but as they begin to be empowered by that, that is a fabulous gift to us as well as to them. Depth of topics, we did an elephant research. One thing we could add to that is we could pick up the app, iPad and say, oh, let's go to the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee. Let's look at the live cam. Let's add a little depth to what we're talking about, making it more real to them. iPads give students more time to record and reflect, whether they're recording um, something they're working on they can play it back and reflect on, is this the right way to do this? Is this the way, right way to present this? Um, Lynn was saying today that her kids were practicing the Christmas program and recording that. And then they were able to go back and look at it. Oh, I wasn't very loud. I need to be louder. And my eyes weren't making eye contact. So they can reflect on what they're doing, which is very powerful. And we're teaching them digital citizenship at a very early age how to take care of the iPad, how to be appropriate with the iPad, how to um, send appropriate emails, or is this email purposeful? Do I need to send this? I need to ask permission if I take your picture. Can I take your picture? Can I use your picture in, in my book? So those are some of the things that how um, iPads have impacted the students. It's been a very exciting journey and we hope that it will continue. I'm going to turn it over to Elise and Mark. And I'm going to have the opportunity to present some of the apps that the students are using and we are using in the classroom. And small sample of the ones that we are using and we'll go over them. The first one that I will talk about is the sponsor numbers and I have to remember not to point here. So. <laughs> <laughs> this one right here. And 
What is nice about this particular app is that students can be working on a variety of skills all at the same time where some students might need practice tracing their numbers or writing their numbers and they can be doing that by another student is practicing counting or another student who is more advanced can be working on higher level numbers. And I'll just real quickly just give an example of what those look like. And I'll be touching the bottom button that says tracing. <coughs> and what the student can do at this point is pick a number he might want to practice. So if I pick the number two. Two. It'll say the number, and over on the side also, it shows two blocks, so they can practice counting. So if they weren't sure what particular number that was, they can count. It also gives them a good starting point of where to begin. And if I would actually trace the numbers, if I'm not actually right on the line, as that happened, it goes away. So the students have to be pretty successful, and they also have to take their time to make sure they get the number correctly. And it gives them an ending point. And now that I got to that ending point, I can progress to the second ending point, number two. So the students get to see that they're successful. And accountability. If yes. they don't get it, they have to do it again. Right. And so you can replay the same number or go back to the screen and try another number. And that some student might be working on that, where I would like to have a student practice counting. The one that says 1 to 20. And at this point, some students might be doing the same activity, but they might be at different particular levels. I assume that needs help with 1 to 5 or 1 to 10, 11 up to 20. They can be doing the same activity, but at a different particular level. And if I just touch the number, and one. all they're doing is just Two. practicing counting with the box. And Three. it'll run through and go all the way through. But Four. then the students would then actually have to physically move Five. the box up for themselves as they count. Six. So. Seven. Eight. Just real quickly let this run through. Nine. Yeah. So now that they go away, now the students would then have to then repeat the same process with the blocks. They would have to move and it help one. count for them. One. So one student might be doing this up to 10 again, and other students might be doing different level numbers. And the students, they like that aspect where they can change instead of using blocks that they want to use cupcakes. It just adds a variety for the students, <laughs> and they enjoy that. <laughs> And just give you another example of what you can do on this particular one. I'll do this blue one that says numerals. Again, you have the opportunity to differentiate by having students working at different levels. So I'll practice the one that says 10 to 99. Can you find 51? I don't know if you could hear that. If that happens in the classroom, which sometimes does. Luckily enough, we also have headphones available for all students. So if it is noisy, all students will be able to have headphones at that time. They can just hit the little question mark. Can you find 51? 51. And in my classroom, what I try to do is have the students first try to find the 10, so they will count their fingers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So they need 5. 5, 50. And it adds 5 groups of 10. And then 1, 51. And it progresses like that. I wish we had like that. Yeah. <laughs> and the other activities are very similar. Again, you can differentiate. And there were this time. Can you in. get five? And can you get five? And it's the same concept, just presented One, in a little different two, three, way for the students. Four, five. This example of this particular app, and what is nice again is a lot of students can be working on the same activity, but they don't realize that they're on a different ability level as their neighbor. They see that they're still doing the same activity, but they're able to work on the level that is appropriate for them. Another app I'd like to show is Story Buddy. And this is one where the students are able to produce and create their own story and book. And when I did this in my classroom with my students, we first practiced with a book about our classroom just to kind of get them familiar with what the app is involved and how to do that. So I'll be pushing the one in this classroom. That's the one that we made in our class. And the students are able, and it's I'm always amazed that they're able to understand what these buttons mean, add it, it means that we're going to change things, read it, we're just going to look at it and share. We'll be able to, what's nice about this, they can actually then email it to their families and it comes into a PDF file for them. And so I'll read the story. What I had is I had each student come up to me, I showed them how to get to the camera, they had to take a picture. And then I showed them as a whole class, once everyone had their picture, we did this as a whole class. and. It's amazing, after everyone had their picture, it took maybe five minutes for them to add this page. I wrote my room on the board. They wrote that down by typing it in real quickly. I showed them where the camera button is. 
they were able to access their camera photos and add the picture and you can adjust the size by using your fingers so with my classroom or my room then they just swipe the like sharing page have them take a picture of their table what's also nice is they have a little drawing tool within the app so if you don't want to use photographs they can draw pictures so I want to make sure I show them how to do that so they can draw a picture of himself and just different parts of the classroom and then after we were familiar with this after practicing over a couple weeks I gave them an option when they took it home if they wanted to create a book about their house or their family they were able to do that it wasn't required but something if they want to then they could share it the class and just give you an example of the students book that he created Again, took a picture of his house. No turn for me. There we go. And he took a picture of himself playing <laughs> at my hockey table, which is nice. He's, <laughs> but actually, he's spelling. You can see that he is actually the one doing the work, mm -hmm. and he's one that is. He just hears those sounds and he'll just write them down, which is nice to see. <coughs> Excuse me. And his family. His bedroom. <laughs> His bedroom. <laughs> In the basement. So. And then Tom has a photography studio, so he put on a studio in the back of my house. This <laughs> opportunity for them to have that connection of work we did at home, you can then translate it back at a classroom or at home. Last year, what I was able to do with this particular app, during our science unit, the students each had a animal, a Michigan animal, that they had to do a little mini research, and all the work was done at home. They had to do research about their animal. They had to write down a report of their habitat, their food, and interesting facts. They wrote the report at home. They drew pictures at home. And then in class, I had them create, they recreated their actual report by typing all the report out. We helped them search for pictures, and we were able to do screenshots on the internet and then add into their classroom book. And then we were able to email them back to the family. So, this is a nice little connection for them to do all the work at home with the actual written work and then be able to use the digital media to recreate the work. So this is an example of Story Buddy. And then the last one I'll be talking about is the very top right corner. I'm not quite tall enough to show you, but it's this word wizard. Oops, let me go to the main screen of this one. And there's two different ways to use this app. I'll first talk about the one that says spelling quizzes. It has some built-in quizzes that is built in with the app and you can see them all right here but what i'd like to use this particular one for is i'm able to type up a list of words that i want them to work on typically it's our word wall words that we've been working on and i actually email it to all the students and when they get it this is what the actual email will look like and you can see in the email they see a picture of the app so they know what that is so they would just touch that picture and touch the picture of the app and what that does is it loads the word list or spelling words that I want them to work on onto their actual machine. So what's nice about that is I can have some students working on a very simple list where I can have other students working on a much harder list, but they don't know that different mm -hmm. students have different actual work lists. So I'll give you an example of what this then looks like. Spell the. The one drawback with this one is, is still that computer generated voice and there's a We'll playing around and getting the students used to hearing that voice but it says spell the so all the students would then have to do is move the letters to create that word and instant feedback because they once they get to the point they know they spelled it correctly spell said so again spell said and then they would just go on and spell that word and again the instant feedback i got it correct so i can go on to my next word there is a hint button Spell. that if the student doesn't, or. they can't progress, or if they're having trouble, they can push this, the question mark. So they do have an option for that support if I'm not able to be with them right at that moment. Another aspect with this particular app is also the movable alphabet. What this one is, is please drag some letters to the board. <laughs> what you'll do is, what in my class, what I do with this one is I practice very simple sentences that contain our word wall words and also just very simple CBC words. Not the most thought provoking sentences, but like I had a cat. So the <laughs> students would then have to just move those tiles and move and to make that word. And what's nice, again, they touch it. It, it will had. So I have A and then you would continue on spelling that particular sentence. 
And if they want to see it, they're correct. They just push the little child's silhouette at the top. I had a cat. And again, mm -hmm. you have to play with the voice. And there's a way, on the settings, you can slow down the voice or speed it up. And there's different voices that you can select. <laughs> but I do this as a center where I have two or three students at a time. And I'll say very simple sentences. For some students, some other students, I might just say a letter. Or I might just say a very simple CVC word and just have them move the tile. And they can always have that reinforcement of pushing that silhouette to see if they spell it correctly. And you can just go to the screen by pushing the room. So those are the three apps that I will explain. explain a couple more apps and then we will be wrapping up here. Um, the great thing about the iPads is a lot of the time we're just reinforcing what we're already doing in the classroom and with handwriting you think well what's going to happen with handwriting on the apps that was one of the questions that we got oh is this going to replace paper pencil and not at all this is just enriching what we're already doing. Um, so I want to show you touch and write that little monster up there. Which handwriting can be a monster? Touch and write. Okay. So if you go to the beginning, I'm just going to go over some Now, Marty had said it's really hard for some kids to hold a pen and, or a pencil, and that's very true. So this is an opportunity for these kids to be successful. On the same notion, the kids who can write it fluently, but maybe aren't forming it the correct way, this will correct that for them. So I'm going to put my finger on the monster, and capital A is to pull down. And then if I tried to go like this, it's not going to let me. So you have to form it the correct way. Pull down, pull down, a. slide across. Now, if you've ever watched a little person create a lowercase a, you get a circle and pop stick on the uh -huh. side. So this is great for us because it's stopping them from doing that anymore. So they have to take the forward, pull up, pull down. A. And a. A. Oh, a. <laughs> <laughs> At the end, in most of the apps, as um, as you complete a level or as you complete something, they'll have a little game or a little celebration. So the kids want to be engaged in these apps because they get to be like, well, I want to be on that game. How many letters do I have to draw before I get to play on that game? So it's really fun to watch. Um, and I could just trace some more letters, but essentially it's the same thing. You can write it with a pencil, shaving cream, ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot more fun than the pen and paper, but we do still do that absolutely all the time. Okay, I'm going to switch from the student iPad over to my iPad. And just show you what some of the apps look like from the teacher's standpoint and how we include them or send them over to the students and the parents and such. So, just a little switch in here. It's private. <laughs> change that tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, down here. You were this, too fast for me, so. <laughs> um, Educreation, this is essentially a digital whiteboard. Um, and it's great because we use this to do lessons with the kids, send it to the parents, and we get a lot of immediate feedback with this. So. With the handwriting um, app that I just showed you, this is another way that we incorporate handwriting. So I'm going to let my little K lesson play here. We sit in a whole group, we talk about the letter. And then any second here, you're going to hear my voice and the kids' voices kick in. Raise your hand. And if it doesn't, then we have a technology problem. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll introduce the letter, we'll talk about it. Kaden. Okay, now we're talking Kaden. about K. We're going to start with K and calling on kids. Yes. Um, the but right they're all a part of this, and you'll hear certain ones that are letter. trying to talk right. over other ones because they can't wait to get this lesson emailed to them and they can show their parents, look what I did in class today, listen to what I was doing. Rima. So after we do this part, the Hi. Do Very good job, everybody. And now, now we are going to learn how to write the letter K. So please put your fingers in the air. And you're going to start at the top. Repeat after me. Please pull down straight. Pull down straight. Pull down straight. Pull down straight. Lift. Lift. Slide. 
plant left. Plant left. Plant right. Plant right. Good. We're going to practice that again in another color, and I'm going to use different words. And the reason I do it in a couple Pull other colors. Pull down straight. And the email is appearance and the student. That was not very straight. They pull it up. They re-listen to the lesson. And I'm going to say slant in. Slant out. Slant out. Good. One more time for capital K. Pull down straight. Pull down straight. Lift. Lift. Plant in. Plant in. Plant out. Plant out. Good. Now we're going to do lowercase k. It starts the same. Pull down straight. Pull down straight. And instead of going up to the top, you come halfway in the middle, which is where your dotted line would be. And then you do a small slant in. Small slant in. Small slant out. Almost out. <laughs> Blue. Pull down straight. Pull down straight. Small slant in. Small slant out. One last time. Pull down straight. Pull down straight. Lift. Lift. Small slant in. Small slant out. Small slant out. Can I end it? And then as I'm sitting there and they're all in front of me, I click the email button, I send it to all the kids, they immediately have it, all the parents immediately have it. So then in class during centers, they pull it up again, they re-engage in the activity immediately, and then when they go home and they do their handwriting, actual penmanship work, the parents can watch, hear the verbiage that I'm using, the pull-down straight, right? And then reinforce it with their kids when they're doing the pen and paper. So this has been a really great tool for us for lots of different lessons that we've um, done. But the letter thing is something we do quite a bit. Um, another app that I'll show you is this Montessori crossword. It's very similar to the one that Mark showed you, but it's not numbers, it's letters and sounds. Um, as Lynn and Marty had both, and Mark had both talked about, is in our classrooms, we have kids engaged in all different apps at the same time that's appropriate for their, for their level. Um, but on the same token, we differentiate it more within the app. So here you can see simple words with three sounds, consonant blends, words of complexity, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of our little ones start off here with your basic CBC words. Fan. Fan. So I have some kids that are going to hear fan, and they're going to go F-A-N, pull the letters up, move on to the next one. Some kids are going to go fan. Okay, the first sound is F. Let me find the F. Pull it up. I might have another kid that goes, okay, fan. The first letter is fan. They don't understand. They can't segment the sound. They can't segment the letters. So what's great about this is if you tap these boxes, it's going to tell you the sound that you're looking for. So. Ah. Ah. Oh, ah. I know that. Mrs. Bauer always eats an apple. Okay. Ah. So. As you can see, some kids look at it one way, some kids can reinforce it just by finding that letter. Mm. Ah. Mm. Fan. And this is how we do words, segment words all the time in our classroom. And the stars are flying. This is your only one. <laughs> yeah. And you can draw and you can continue. Yeah. Man. So. What we do is, I have the kids follow a certain structure. They say the word man. So they have to go say man, man. Say the word man. They all sound like you're in man. They would go mm, ah, mm. So some kids can't do that, but it, that is the structure that they are uh, supposed to use. So same thing. Mm. Pull it. And if you try uh. the wrong word, wrong letter, it won't let you, which is great. Ah. Immediate feedback. It's correction. It's helping them engage in the things mm. that everybody around them can do. Mm. Ah. Mm. Man. And Mark's, like Mark said, the voices are a little off, but they get there. Wig. And so we have words of different difficulties. There's a Christmas theme one that they're really excited about sometimes. And you can make your own one. You can have a movable alphabet. It's very similar to the word with one that he was showing you. So that's a great app. I'm just going to show you one more. This one here is I Like Books, and as you know, a huge component of reading, writing, or of kindergarten is reading, um, and some kids struggle with reading, so we wanted a reading app. This app will read to you, which is wonderful. Um, I happen to have, a few of us have some students that don't speak any English, so this has been really great for them because it, you can 
choose this option of read to me. So. So many animals. Let's meet them all. Yeah, it does. I've never seen it do that before, but it is skipping right now for the projector. Um, so it highlights, but that moved pretty fast. That would be maybe for my average kid. But if you go back to my ones who are just learning the language. So you can many one at a time. animals. Let's. So, or if they read and they get stuck. And then one other thing that the kids do in my classroom is, OK, so many animals. Let's meet them all. Some of these kids can read it on their own. So they'll choose this button top there and you can record yourself so many animals let's meet them all and then hit record button and then you can listen to yourself so right. many animals let's meet them all so the kids who can read up right off the bat they can record themselves the first time engaging in the book kids who need to hear it one two ten times they can listen to it over and over and then they can have the same success that Billy next to them is having at the same level book which is really amazing um, and there's lots of apps out there and reading subscriptions for leveled books A all the way to Z, um, but this is a great opportunity for us to work with what we have. And with that, okay, let us kind of come right here. Well, as you can see, the, they've really been used as great teaching and learning tools, and it's uh, really changed our practice. Linda, as a former kindergarten teacher of years gone by, my have times changed, huh? <laughs> so uh, at this point, we'd like to entertain any questions uh, or comments that you have. Yes? Um, where do you find all these apps? Is there a central location? Is there somewhere you can give feedback back so other teachers know? Is there, you know, is this in use enough? That a lot of research, a lot of time and hours experimenting, downloading. Uh, yep. Yep. Come on up to the mic, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> I said a lot of time exploring apps. Um, when we were awarded the iPads for kindergarten, the hardest part was finding all the right tools to go on there. You're so nervous because you're doing this for all of kindergarten in Midland Public. So you carefully and you just carefully select the apps that you want. And we continually look for new apps, or we ask parents, hey, do you have an app you're using at home? What's working? Other teachers? Uh, when, when I started the initiative, there was the, or there still is, the SharePoint site. So even first grade, second grade teachers, we would comment, this app was good, this is what we liked, okay. this is something we didn't like. So within Midland Public Schools, we all had the opportunity to share how we felt about the apps. Um, and then we just continue to look for the best ones out there. How often do you use the iPads in a normal day? How many minutes, hours? Well, that's a great question. We use them every day. It just Lynn? depends on our day. Um, you know, we, we, we put together, we think that's the last year. How many minutes a day? It's hard to really pinpoint that because we might not be using them for a long, a, a long length of time. It could be that little intervals throughout the day. Um, so they're used for our lessons, they're used for independent learning, they're used in collaboration, just sporadically throughout the day. Um, I don't know that we really have a time. And some kids use them more than others, if they need it or it deems appropriate at that time. And we use them for our instruction, so ours is being used constantly throughout the day just to pull something up, show something, and demonstrate. Um, but the, I would say the engaged time in each task is limited. But they're not plugged in all day. Do you, do you see that there's an uh, achievement, an improvement in achievement by using the iPads from years of not having them to? Well, it's a good question. Um, it's one that's kind of unique for our grade level that's here tonight with our use of iPads because. Um, Certainly, that, that's a new variable for us as a teaching tool, the iPads last year, but so is full day kindergarten. Oh, so I think we want right. to be cautious before we you know, would make any firm declarative statements. I would th say what we believe is the case right now is, is we are seeing um, an increased uh, depth of knowledge, uh, increased collaboration, increased um, repetitions, 
and of course the differentiation uh, the abilities of the teachers to get the kids the extra reps is is you might say easier than ever thank you oh, go ahead and go. do you find that you have more communication with the parents you, you mentioned that because it is so immediate and you can send so many more things home and just one other comment I all everything that you talked about is so exciting but I think what excites me the most is seeing the opportunity for that differentiation for each child and we've heard that in, a, in, uh, in other presentations and at other times but how each student can be working on the same thing and feel good about what their their own achievement is thank you okay. uh, just wanted to start out with a compliment I appreciate you guys expanding your horizons um, the amount of time that you put in because it's the second year for the kindergarten at Woodcrest to have the the iPads and I just think it's great that you have some longitudinal data or approach to that so you guys don't have to start out from square one because the iPads could have gone to another grade so I think there's value into that long term seeing uh, the growth in the students and also with the teachers and you guys are to be congratulated as being learners um, a huge undertaking and you know collaboration with a lot of your other teachers so you guys uh, really did a great job um, anyway, I think in your profession you probably see a lot more of that changing and I would imagine that um, compared to other school systems, I mean, is this the way to go or, I, I mean, are we seeing some of your colleagues, are, are, they, are they saying don't go in the iPad direction or the one-to-one -one learning? What are you guys seeing in your We don't want to live without them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think it's just going to, the, the, the trend is going to probably go more in that direction. And so as far as when the iPads go home with the students, do you think you're getting more soak time with the curriculum that you otherwise would have not have gotten? Absolutely. I think that um, the apps that we've chosen carefully to um, purchase and to load onto the iPads uh -huh. are support our curriculum 100%. And so in the chat, in, in, yeah, she's got the differentiation, so the child needs repetitions just with the with the, the standard for mm -hmm. the um, four, you know, they have that, but the child needs an extension that's available as well. So it's just a great way to meet the needs of all of our learners. And, and, and as I think I had mentioned, we feel so much more meaningful time spent um, assignments that we're giving are more meaningful and beneficial to the children. And they see this as a play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They still see and, and I sort of ask that question is knowing a little bit about it because last year um, this is told with Ryan having his iPad I think he spent more time that we would have not otherwise have gotten out of a kindergartner uh, last year with the material and if you can have kids have fun but learn and maybe get more repetition I think that's great it's a great way to engage these kids so I think that's just fabulous I just wanted to say something though in, in praise of teachers I just wanted to say it's not that teachers were never creative before they have always been and it's not that they didn't have ways to teach children that worked because they've always found them but I think the important point that stands out for me is this is the world they live in and will live in I think that's what's one of the things to me that's so important about it is that we have to prepare them for the world they live in I think you're it's excellent I, I loved your presentation it was great thank you so much and I have a few questions too. Um, <laughs> reflecting on your comment, it also makes it easier to be more creative. You don't have to spend time, materials, it's there. Yeah, yeah. And it really helps you. But a, a few key questions. When we were um, going through the millage, I remember some public comments by some young parents hugely concerned about, you know, yes. technology overwhelming yes. things mm -hmm. and becoming the focus and, and uh, you know, to the point of saying, you know, if we have this, our children aren't going to attend MBS because it's too technology centered. Mm -hmm. Now, when I see your presentation, I certainly don't come with that impression. Mm -hmm. Do you want to opine on that based on your classrooms, how you feel about that? And is that, is that a valid statement, a concern statement? Uh, I, I, I think they need to come in and see what's happening mm -hmm. to get a glimpse of how this is helping their child or how this ch their child is collaborating now the child who can't spell or can't read can somehow show you how to use the technology over here. 
it's, so it's building something in them that they, they would get otherwise. It's a different way to get at different things. Different things. For children. And the important thing for those parents is to know we're still doing all the other stuff that is on top. Mm -hmm. We work well, really hard to have a good job. Well, in the end, they're learning how to make their letters. They're learning how to spell. They're learning how to sound words. Yeah. Method is. Well, I think one of the key things too, Jerry, is that it's a tool. Yeah. Um, it's not the program. And as you've heard, I mean, it's a it's a tool that you know, just like a carpenter, you don't use the hammer all the time. So uh, they use use it to to meet those standards and. You know, but it's by no means uh, the program. Yeah, it's clear as you were demonstrating, it's a means to an end, not a end in of itself. Mm -hmm. I love how you send it home and the parents know how to do the letters. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you, you know how often we find out what we're doing wrong from our kids? <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. so this way, you know what I mean? But then you can make sure that you're helping your child in the right way. <laughs> so. um, and I was intrigued by a couple of things. And it was when you had the student iPad up. I, it was interesting to me, and I, I assume you're demonstrating it, but many of the bubbles or selection icons you would push had fairly sizable words to them, not mm -hmm. just pictures. Mm -hmm. And some of them were just sizable words. Are they figuring that out? Mm -hmm. like, like when I use them, sometimes I have them as a station. What I've gone through is on the internet, I found a clip art picture of every single app made them cut them out so if these three students are going to go to I have different color tables like the owner's table they see a picture of whatever particular app they're using so they can then associate by the picture and then we also talk about the names of the app the number one I just call that one the counting with blocks app so they pick that up very quickly yeah because some of those some of those icons were count or uh, right. or numerals and I was taken aback we go through each one one at a time and we reinforce that right now we're working on this particular app this is one that you need to be working on right now and make sure that they're not going to a different app without us first introducing them so they have prior knowledge before they open this app and start going they have okay. the prior knowledge in class and, and then the motivated kids figured out figured out yeah and, and they're learning word associations just from the fact it's sitting there yeah. and you're saying the word they don't want to waste any time to get there like in that story buddy app you can read it or edit it and i have have had children who don't sound anything out, and they're like, edit, 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 because they don't want to wait for me to come get it. They figure it out on their own. So well, well, <laughs> then, dude, just to get to it, they have to pick something that, yeah. that and then in, a, in the corollary to that, that was in, on the very first thing you said with the student one, is the email. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sitting here going, mm -hmm. okay, we have kindergartners who are just learning to read and write, sending emails home, now, and learning how to do it appropriately. And, and That's the names great and all part. This, <laughs> To me, it's like a cart and horse. You, mm -hmm. you, you've got this tool that how do they know how to use that when they don't know how to spell or write yet? Uh, can you can you comment? Yeah, they're not afraid. You know, we're afraid to, to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Kindergarten children are not afraid to try things, so they do a lot of trial and error. Really? And, um, they reach obviously in block block whose desk and how to retrieve an email, so they know where they should be touching it, they don't necessarily be able to read all those words, but they know how to access their email. So they're not fit with us. But they're not afraid to explore it. Mm -hmm. And they find out a lot of things that way. When well, they figure out how to write, I love, and then your name, you get a lot of emails. <laughs> 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 what, what great practice, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought of one thing. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, it was interesting, and Marty, I think this was in your presentation, is that there were some key words that kind of buzzwords from the IBPYP program, mm -hmm. reflection, collaboration. Are you guys kind of thinking along that line where yeah, this, this is going to be, you know, as far as having world views and be able to incorporate that in? It seems like you, this would be quite a great tool for that, uh, as well as the other tools, of course, that Mr. Penix mentioned. So, But I, I kind of see that going in that direction. We have to find a long-term solution for this. This is just too good. Mm -hmm. We don't want to miss this. We don't want to give them up. <laughs> <laughs> don't break them. <laughs> well, thank you. On behalf of the board, thank, thank you. you very much. Very enlightening, and I hope folks on TV are watching this till they get a view of how technology is used in a classroom and can be used in a classroom, even in oh, kindergarten. Sure. Yep. We have some words from one of our kindergartners. Oh. Maybe. We've been waiting for it. <laughs> 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 
Thanks again for the opportunity oh, to share thank this you. with you. Thank you. Thank you. Very powerful stuff. Thank you, folks. I enjoyed that. That was a great presentation. We have two more presentations tonight, and um, Scott Cochran, I think, is leading both of them. So I'll turn it over to Scott, but I'm not seeing him. Hello, Scott. I saw him. Yeah, there he is. There he is. <laughs> Floor is all yours, Scott, and you can introduce. Thank you. I was uh, running down to the TV station real quick because uh, Scott Cochran, social studies and art curriculum specialist, also manages the TV station, and I don't run as much as I should. Clearly, <laughs> and uh, work with our ESL students. So, in the interest of the students that have been waiting to talk to you about IB art, we're going to go ahead and, as long as it's okay with you, swap things in order. So, Cindy, maybe you can help me out with the technology piece. <laughs> but we're going to have the IB art students go next, okay. and, while, and then I'll go after them. So. But while Cindy's doing the technology switch, by well, way of introduction, we're going to need to. <laughs> Pay no attention. Uh, by way of introduction, let me just say this. I, I continue to be impressed more and more with what's happening in the IB art program because as I understand more and more what's happening, it, obviously there's phenomenal art and you see that here. But understand, the real magic is understanding the process and what goes behind the development of that art. And so that's what you'll hear about tonight and you'll also hear about uh, what is one of our truly college and career ready program. If you want to talk about a program that prepares kids for success in college, for success after school, this is one of them. As represented by uh, IB test scores that continually outperform the international average. Uh, last year's graduating class from our IB art classes earned over $800,000 in college scholarships. We're approaching a million dollars in college scholarships on an annual basis. So it's so impressive. Yeah. And so I've had three teachers here, uh, Carol Lewin and Kurt Gledhill and Mark, Dr. Mark Francisco, and then uh, three students from each school here to talk about the IB art program. So please make them feel welcome. Good evening. I'm here tonight. My name is Carol Lewin, and I've taught art at Dow High School for many years. I'm here to celebrate a wonderful program and a wonderful bunch of kids, hardworking kids. Um, I'd like to do a little brief overview, and you um, can have one of these. As a matter of fact, we made sure that all the board members and uh, superintendents had this. But you can receive a copy of this if you'd like it. In an uh, effort to be succinct, I plan to paraphrase a little bit. <laughs> um, as you know, the IB program was brought to Midland Public Schools as initiated by the Dow Chemical Company because they recognized their families would benefit by an internationally certified program. IB Visual Art is a part of Group 6, the Arts of the IB program. Contributing to being awarded the IB Charter for the Midland Public Schools, the International Charter Committee recognized that our students were producing artwork that was of a high caliber throughout our current program. After each school was interviewed and a charter was awarded at Midland Public Schools, we started the IB Visual Art Program following instructor training in stages. It started at Herbert Henry Dow High School in 2008. Later, Midland High joined Herbert Henry Dow and offered IB Visual Art the following year in 08-09. And then in 2009-10, Midland Public Schools was implementing the entire visual art program at both schools. 
An IB visual artist student must be a junior or senior to elect the course. An SL certificate is obtained as a result of testing in a single elected year. An HL certificate is obtained by, by, uh, as a result of testing over the course of two years. A student enters the course as either a research-based artist who supports the research via producing artwork in the studio or as a production-based artist who supports their artwork via investigation and research. A visual arts student is expected to both research and document their findings in an investigation workbook, and this sketchbook works in tandem with what is produced in the studio, and our students will share that with you this evening. What does the IB visual art program do for our students? It raises the rigor bar to an international standard and gives internationally, international credibility to an already strong art program. It raises student raises student artists to an expressive level with their artwork. It places value in the process of producing artwork over the final product. It puts a great deal of emphasis on the symbiotic relationship between research, trial, making, and understanding artwork. It gives the high school studio artist and designer purpose in their artwork and the byproduct of this program beyond the value of the development of high school studio artists is evidenced in the hundreds and thousands of scholarship offers to our graduating art students each year, as well as our art students are annually accepted to prestigious art and design schools and universities nationally and internationally. I now would like to take a moment and introduce my great colleague, Kurt Gledhill, who will introduce each of our students and share with you how this program has personally impacted each student. Kurt? Um, Kurt Gledhill, uh, also art teacher at H.H. Uh, Dow High School at Carroll. Um, we have a number of students we brought with us tonight that will each talk about different aspects of the IB program and. Um, how they all interlace together. So our first um, student is Miss Caitlin Blakemore, and she'll be talking about how her cultural and global research has influenced her artwork. Uh, um, hello. Um, so when I do research, I like to look at um, countries beside American countries or European countries. And so when I started off, I decided to research Australia because I was born in New Zealand, and so I felt like it'd be a culture that was close to what's important to me. And normally when I do my research, I like to look at um, researching government and economics and social classes and things that could have an impact on art besides um, the literal artwork and the history of the art movement. And I also like to pay attention to the uh, pigments and paints that cultures use and the different materials they paint on. And that's one of the things that I normally like to incorporate into my artwork. And so I have an example here, which is a painting I'm working on right now. Um, it's, based, it's called an Aboriginal dot painting. And what I'm doing is incorporating the color that is normally found in Aborigines paintings, which is mostly yellows, browns, and ochres. And so that's what I'm working on right now. And So after I do my research, before I start the painting that I choose to do, I always like to do a sketch of what I'm planning for it to look like and incorporate the ideas that I've learned throughout my research and anything that I feel could be important overall and what I can take from it. And one more thing that I think is really important about doing all this research and that I really enjoy about it is that I've noticed that things I've learned in my art class have actually been incorporated into other classes that I'm taking, such as like AP World History. So it's actually helping me with my other schoolwork too, which I think is really important. Wow. Um, our next student will be um, Miss Kylie Workentine, who will be talking about how her um, fine art uh, historical influence has influenced her artwork. All right, my name is Kylie Workentine. I'm a National League candidate from Midland High. And what I like to do in my research for IB art, I like to take something simple and personal and I like to progress that idea through my research to make multiple pieces that all connect within each other. So this first page that I'm showing is my first project which I started simply by researching my name. My name literally means boomerang 
I'm not joking. <laughs> so I went from that idea, as silly as it sounds, and I researched boomerangs. And I came to the uh, discovery that it actually boomerangs are made of birch wood. So therefore, I went to birch trees, and I researched certain artists, such as Kessler Woodward, who is famous for birch tree paintings. You can see one of his pieces here. And I did my own painting of birch trees. And from that, I further researched Kessler, who is uh, currently residing in Alaska. So then I researched Alaskan traditional art. And I had so much fun researching all of the uh, tradition in it and all the symbolism in it. And I came to a new piece, which I did later, of a puffin, which is a creature of the Arctic. And I show my connections to Kessler Woodward. And then I also added in a lot of cubism aspects to this piece, which I then brought into a third piece of artwork, which connected to this one. And this was a strong perspective piece, which was all geometric, which related to the cubism that I studied originally. So through all this research and the progressing of my ideas, I was able to create three different pieces that look so different, but how they all connect through their research. And that has really helped me in my art. And when I present, I now have a story behind it because it's not just about the final piece, it's about what you have behind it and what you can back it up with. And that's something Ivy Art has taught me. And I really appreciate it. Very nice. Okay, our next student will be uh, Mr. Aaron Collins, who is going to be talking about two different aspects of the Ivy program. He's going to um, give you a little bit of an insight of what it's like to do the testing in the spring through the IB program. He's um, in his second year of IB. And then he's also going to walk you through the steps that he went through to develop one single idea and all of the variations. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Collins, and I'm a second year IB visual arts student. As part of the certification process, we have to submit a video interview. The interview is submitted along with our sketchbooks, finished pieces, and personal statement. To, review, to be reviewed by an IB tester. For the interview, students must take their eight to 12 best pieces or pieces that best follow their theme, which is expressed in our sketchbooks, along with their sketchbook and personal statement to present them in a interview format to their teachers. Uh, in these interviews, teachers allow them to describe what they've done that year and also ask them questions regarding their artwork. As you see here, this is a sketch I did uh, in a part of a class period, and I showed it to Mr. Butthill. He said, that's a really nice sketch, but where's the meaning? <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what, is it, what does it mean? I had no idea when I was drawing it. So I came up with the meaning. <laughs> 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 which you see here. Um, and from that, he said, OK, now make something that you make another sketch that you actually had the meaning in mind when you were drawing it. And that was this one. So it's kind of reflecting poorly. But. And then refine that further into this composition, which then refined further into the uh, drawing of the, uh, sorry, you can't really see it. Next to self-portrait. Next to self-portrait. I don't see it. Oh, I see it. And, OK, and um, then our next person will be uh, Ms. Callie Winslow, who will be talking about um, the artistic process. Ivy Art has taught me that art is about more than just the finished piece. It's also about the ideas and the processes that go into creating something. Now, I'm going into neuroscience, so it might not seem like an art class is a very relevant class for me, but actually the skills learned in IB art are invaluable in whatever field you go into. It's given me the freedom to structure my own curriculum around things that are interesting to me so that I can create art that's not only beautiful, but also meaningful. When I begin a project, I start by researching a topic or artist that is interesting to me, and then I explore it myself through my art. So this is part of my research for the series of watercolor faces that you can see over there. And I started by researching self-esteem and how it relates to the media. 
And I wanted to do a piece that shows natural beauty over um, processed images. So I did those paintings from people that I knew and asked them to send me pictures, so it was a very natural thing. And it has so much more meaning when you do art <coughs> with a purpose instead of just creating something that's nice to look at. And this process of developing ideas, doing research, and exploring them personally is a vital skill in any field. So I feel that this class has prepared me more than anything for my life in college and beyond. Okay, our next student will be um, Miss Alexis Berenger, who will be talking a little bit about what brought her into the art program, specifically the IB program. Hi, I'm Alexis Berenger. Um, ever since I was very little, it's always been a passion of mine to be an artist. I've always wanted and dreamed of being an artist someday, but I guess the thing that I was really afraid of was the stereotypical starving artist. I was always afraid that you know I wouldn't be able to keep a life for myself, I wouldn't be able to make a living or anything like that. And so. When I got into high school, I made the decision that I was going to go into psychology. And don't get me wrong, I love psychology, but earlier this year, I made the decision that it just, it's not who I am. I, I'm an artist, and I've, I've always dreamed of being an artist. And so five weeks into the school year, obviously later than everybody else, I approached Mr. Glenn Hill and Mrs. Lewin, and I talked to them about being, into the, or, um, being accepted into the IBR program. And I was accepted, and um, what, what's this, what this class has really done for me is it's really showed me and helped me realize that really what I want to be is an artist. And it's helped me, I needed a class that was going to get me all the skills that I needed to, in order to get into the college that I want to go into for being in art because I only have one art class background in high school. So this is the class that was really going to get me all of the experience I needed. It was going to get me all the, all the skills I, I needed. It was going to give me the time to set aside, uh, set a time in my day to uh, actually work on the things that I needed to work on, get things that I needed to get done. And even just sitting down and talking with Mrs. Lewin one afternoon, I've learned so much about how there really is so many places you can go with art. There really isn't a specific, I mean, there's so many things you can go with it. So, I mean, I'm really, it's really helping me decide who I am and really helping me decide what I want to do with my life. Okay, and our last student uh, this evening will be uh, Mr. Hunter Marsh, who will be talking a little bit about his IB Visual Art Reflection. Hi there. Like you said, my name is Hunter Marsh, and I am an HL, or higher level, student in the IB Art program. IB Art has trained me to be able to look into other cultures to find new ways to explain my own ideas and my own thoughts about life. Um, being able to reflect on my life and faith, which is so extremely crucial to who I am and what everything I do, um, with a larger cultural lens has impacted me into the topics that I researched and explained through my art has changed who I am today. Um, see over there, I have the big, like, orangey abstract piece. I mean, that's my take on the resurrection of Jesus, who, um, I mean, that's just, just part of the key things that make me who I am today. Um, reflecting on everything that I've done within the past year or two, um, being able to look into the things which I want to do with the rest of my life, like faith. Um, being able to see, okay, this is why. Being able to reflect, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, going into what I'm doing, and going where I'm going. I, everything's just connecting because of this course. Um, being able to reflect through and understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Thank you. Um, I would just like to take a minute to thank the students that took their time to come this evening to share that with you, if you can do that with me. Thank you. Dr. Mark Francisco is going to wrap this up with some thoughts of his own. Well, I wish they, I could say they were thoughts of my own. I've learned at this point in life, usually the thoughts of others are better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, IB Art, I've uh, been examining with IB Art since 2007, uh, and have reviewed probably over a thousand uh, students' work from around the world. And from Europe, there's tomes of evaluation materials that we have to read. Well then, in the classroom, I teach IB Art. So, as a teacher, you make it simple. And it's three R's. It's, it's research, it's reflection, and it's art. <laughs> so, that uh, paradigm is what all these students are representing to you. There's, there's two from each paradigm. One of the issues we had back in 2004 was when our students graduate, many of them go to college in art, and high achievers, and then they crumble because they're asked questions and they can't defend their, their stance. Um, or they go into other careers. Well, 
IV answers that issue through the research, through the reflection, through the ability to think uh, on one's feet. And I could go on and on and on because I'm gifted at talking for long periods of time getting paid for it. <laughs> but uh, let me uh, just read a testimonial that's qualitative. We have many students that have gone on and done very well because of IV art. This one I think encapsulates it extremely well for both Carol and I and our students, Kurt's students as well. And it, uh, let me see if I can read it here. I forgot my glasses tonight. Sign of aging. I need to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back now as a sophomore in college, IV art was one of the best courses I took in terms of college prep. The critical thinking skills and creative ability it fostered in me have proved to be invaluable. It helped me practice the self-discipline and responsibility that are essential to succeed in college. The research and the collaborative brainstorming that occurred at different points reflects what it means to be an academic. You have to be able to explain and document your process. Present your creative ideas to people for feedback and criticism. Provide constructive feedback in return. Bounce ideas off your peers. Consider different viewpoints on your ideas. Respond to ongoing conversations in the discipline by drawing on the work of others. Literally drawing on the work of others in Ivy Art. Accurately acknowledge your research sources and make connections between widely varying ideas to produce a central theme. Ivy Art helped me win a full ride scholarship to the honors program at Central Michigan University. Because of my IB experience researching and learning, I had a deeper understanding of art than I had of any other discipline. I was able to draw on this understanding to answer a scholarship essay prompt that asked about paradigm shifts within disciplines. In addition, the core values of IB very much align with the core values of the CMU Honors Program. These values learned through IB Art not only helped me get admitted to Central in the Honors Program and helped me succeed once I got there as well. And then further thanks that how IB Art was truly a wonderful class, one of my best experiences in high school. There were others that we wanted to have come and talk to the podium tonight who have uh, got full ride scholarships in various colleges around Michigan. They're all taking exams tonight. so. <laughs> but uh, they all attest to basically the same thing. This seemed to encapsulate it the best. Um, I could go on and on because we, we really love this program. We love what it does for kids. But I think you probably have some questions, don't you? So my role at this point is if you have questions, please ask. And we'd love to answer them as best we can. I'm going to open up to the board for questions. But for all questions, I'm going to uncharacteristically jump in front and uh, make a statement. You know, always loved what I saw. And now I see what's behind a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And I just have a simple word, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. And uh, with that, I'll open up the board for questions and further comment. Mm -hmm. I, I can start here. Yeah, thank you for your time coming out and giving the presentation. This really has been informative. And I'm impressed with the work. It, it is, that is amazing, the work that you students have done and, and the, the teachers that support them. You guys definitely deserve, uh, definitely uh, to be commended in your careers and the dedication to the arts. One thing I just heard, um, just said, uh, in the presentation is that if the students aren't necessarily prepared to go into an art school or go into an art uh, college, that one of the things that limits them going maybe to the full distance, maybe bachelor's, getting through that program, going to a master's level, and maybe end up in different careers, is you said that the ability to defend their position, sort of like their, like their niche as far as the, their work, that's very interesting. I, I just never thought that that would be a barrier to students wanting to look at a, in a long-term track in a program. But that's just very interesting, to, that self-reflection piece and how they have, form an identity in the art community. That really is neat. Is that a question? No, <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just me saying I've learned something, really. And I just, I just didn't realize that. That's the information revolution. That's the iPad. That's the, you know, having the iPod, having access to immediate information. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing now. It can't just be a pretty picture. It's worth a thousand words. And it's connected to a, what? We have a 10,000 year culture now, you know, a global culture with China. And uh, there has to be that, that foundation. Uh, we're in a global. What we're creating in IV art, and this is not a, uh, you know, extreme advertisement. This is just simply reality. We're creating global leaders, people who can think creatively on their feet and defend their position. Product managers would be a term they'd use at Dow, uh, but it's a very similar kind of thinking that goes on. That's Sorry amazing. to answer a question that wasn't a question. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, no, but it's just, it's just amazing to learn that, that that's such an important 
uh, piece in long-term success. You would think, well, they get some great test scores, get some great experience in IBs, maybe get some credits to go to school, but to really develop as individuals kind of their own identity. I really learned something today, so I appreciate it. Thanks for saying that. That's awesome. I'll just say, uh, my Sarah took uh, the IB art class, and I learned an awful lot more from all of you tonight about what the process was. But Mark, I tell you, she's using those skills to this day in, in her journaling and just the research and her collaborative. And she's not going into art. Uh, she's actually going into science with elementary ed. But one of you commented about the science part of it and, and how it, it relates to that, the detail and the research. And I think she's found that valuable. And uh, she hasn't had time to take any art classes, but she is going to take, uh, she's going to be studying abroad in Rome and is taking an art drawing class in Rome, and then we'll be journaling on, on that. So all of what you're saying, I'm seeing her now applying that two years later with research, detail, journaling, self-reflection, so. Her junior year at Michigan State? Sophomore. Sophomore year. Yeah. So thank you all for, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for sharing it. It is a tremendous program, and you are all very, very talented, and I wish you well. I do have a question, too. Um, were all the students here, did they do research-based art, or were any of the students doing production-based? All students do research and production, but it's a matter of if it's uh, research-focused, it's 60% research, 40% production. If it's uh, production-focused, it's 60% production, 40% research. Okay, so each student does both. Right. There's different standards in assessment, though, when they are in April when they go through the exams. The research students are assessed differently than the production students. Okay. Similar, but different. Does that explain it clearly enough? Yeah, I was, that's good. Okay. And then how many students between Midland and Dow are involved in the? We have a low number this year, it's just 28. Okay. <laughs> I think we had. Really? We've, we've had a lot go through at different times. But it, it's like anything, you have ebbs and flows. Any others? And uh, Ms. Lewin, will you come to the podium for a second? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little public recognition. How's Cheryl. your daughter doing? <laughs> well, you're going to find out. <laughs> uh, I was going to just mention to the public that my daughter Kara took a single art class <laughs> from Carol back in the day, not that long ago. And she's not an artist. And uh, you well know that. <laughs> uh, but someone who kind of seems to appreciate it. And uh, what, she's a young professional in Milwaukee now. We went to visit. And uh, her and her mom went out shopping, came back, and mom wanted to take a nap. Said, Dad, I got some place. Let's go to the art museum. I want to take it to the art museum. <laughs> all right. And it's down the street from where she lived. And that was, I thought that was really, you know, first of all, fascinating. What really fascinated me, she was an annual member. So that was, and so that's from you. Thank Tell her I said hello, will you? <laughs> Thank you. That. I guess, I guess what, another thing that we all want to say in closing is um, we're very grateful to the Dow Chemical Company for underwriting the cost of the testing and the program. And we really sincerely hope that we continue to offer these opportunities at both high schools. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Scott will finish up again with uh, elementary social studies in the Common Core. How's that for setting yourself up? I told them that my first talk to the teachers about this, I said, you are going last because I'm not going after you. <laughs> Yet here we are, so that's the way it goes. Uh, how'd you like to follow that act? Uh, it is a very impressive program and you know what's amazing is what you see here and what you're hearing here uh, you, you know what's wonderful and it's also very common it's happening every year in those classrooms uh, it's ongoing and it's just it never ceases to amaze so so excited about that so after elementary iPads we went all the way up to uh, 
you know, juniors and seniors in high school and art work. And now we're going to go back down to elementary school and take a look at elementary social studies and the Common Core state standards. How are we applying the Common Core in the elementary classroom, specifically uh, in the area of social studies? So we're going to uh, take a little tour of that. As you probably know, at the elementary level, the Common Core is focused primarily on mathematics and language arts. And within language arts, we also take a look at social studies and science. And specifically, we're looking at literacy and history, social studies, uh, science, and technical subjects. So the idea of literacy, meaning taking a look at informational reading and writing, at, at literature, so both nonfiction and fiction, and also speaking and listening. And of course, we all know that in social studies, uh, speaking and listening is a key skill. Uh, you see it exhibited here at every, every board meeting, for example. So this is where the Common Core applies directly to social studies. One thing that uh, is in the Common Core is the idea that we want students to be using both uh, informational, uh, nonfiction, and literature or fiction texts. In fact, the Common Core calls for the fourth grade level for it to be a 50-50 split between the two. And then as students get older, more heavily into the nonfiction, of course, the informational text, uh, up to the point that they're recommending for seniors that they have 70% uh, informational text. Of course, if you go younger, uh, and of course that happens, right? Because our students are in math and social studies and science in addition to their English classes. Younger than fourth grade uh, would be trending more towards the, uh, the literature or the, the fictional uh, piece, but when we talk about we still need up to 30% uh, in the Common Core calls for up to 30% at the younger, early elementary grade levels is informational text or nonfiction. And this is an area where, as I've talked with teachers at that level, that they're asking for some assistance. You know, yes, we have informational text. Yes, we use it. We teach from it. But we don't have as much as is being called for. So we know that we ask our elementary teachers to do a lot. So how do we help them reach these uh, goals that are set within the Common Core and also teach uh, the social studies content, which is everybody's favorite subject, social studies, clearly, from my perspective. All right, so if we're going to take a look at reading and writing at the elementary level within the Common Core, in reading, we're looking at four different things. We're looking at key ideas and details, what's the core information. We're looking at craft and structure, how's it organized. Uh, knowledge and ideas, which would be more of the big picture. And a range of text complexity. We want our students to be using uh, lots of different types of content. Some that's very simple, so it's easy for them. Some that's very hard and maybe a little bit above where they are so they can stretch. And then, of course, some that's right, uh, right where they are. Within writing, we're looking at having a variety of text types and purposes. It's not just about reading a book, uh, although that's wonderful. It's also about uh, consuming media, consuming uh, people talking to you and telling you information and being able to understand their perspectives and biases. Uh, it's being able to interpret information in lots of different ways. Being able to produce and publish, not just to write, but to uh, publish it for consumption by others. To be doing research, very important in social studies, and to be writing lots of different ways. To be writing over time, you maybe you write a more formal paper that, or more formal writing for a young student that will take up to two weeks, taking a little bit at a time. Or you might have an instant response, write down two words that this makes you think of. And then we're going to talk about that. You have a range of time, you have a range of purposes, and a range of audiences. So what does it look like for our teachers? If you ask uh, a teacher to show you the Common Core, they have a series of about 40 pages, for example, at the elementary uh, reading and writing uh, that look like this. So there's a variety of charts. I know you can't read it from where you are. I just want to give you an idea of what it actually looks like. This is the reading standards for informational text for grades uh, kindergarten, first, and second grade. And then it's divided into the four areas uh, that we were talking about, the key ideas and details, craft, ideas, and then text complexity. And so there's different goals for teachers to reach by the end of each grade level. And it's all laid out so they can see uh, what their students need to do and then where they're headed. Where will they be in first grade, and second grade, and third grade, and so on. Uh, this is for informational text. Of course, it's also for literature as well. But informational text is where we first uh, started looking at how can we do more social studies in the elementary classroom applying these ideas. And where are we headed with this? We're preparing our students for new assessments, a new MEET or MME that'll be starting 
uh, in the spring of 2015. So not this school year, but by the end of next school year. So that is where we're headed. And of course, we want our students and uh, teachers to feel like they're well prepared for that. So if that's a little bit of the background, what's the meat of it? Uh, here at Midland Public Schools, what was our elementary social studies project? I was working on this proposal at home, and my son told me I had to have better transitions. <laughs> <laughs> Those two transitions were the ones that you're in. All right, so you have to listen to Peter's collaboration with my 15-year-old. All right, so the, uh, what is our goal in the elementary social studies practice? We want to empower our elementary teachers to use social studies to apply the Common Core. We don't want to give them more work to do. We want them to uh, be able to do more things at once. So what are the steps that we took? We wanted to train. Uh, we trained everybody in how to use the Common Core. What is it? We researched the best tools uh, that we could use to better implement the social studies at the elementary level. And you see some of those tools in front of you there. Um, and then we developed social studies assignments that integrated Common Core concepts uh, that we'll be distributing to all teachers based on the materials that you see in front of you. Training, there was very extensive training, uh, specifically with regard to social studies. As you know, in our professional development days, we get together with groups of social studies teachers or elementary teachers who are focused uh, on the social studies. And we spent, this says 2012-13, but it was really a half a year before that as well. So a year and a half focused on what is the Common Core, how can I teach it, how does it apply to social studies at kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, out through fifth grade. Uh, in last school year, uh, with the rest of my colleagues in the curriculum division, we introduced the Common Core to all elementary teachers district-wide. We went out to the buildings to do that. And then this summer and into the fall, uh, again with the, the curriculum division uh, together as a collaborative effort, we had a six-hour, four-subject training in the Common Core for all elementary teachers. So everyone uh, who works for us as an elementary teacher has had that training. And then, of course, we're working on it right away on applying it. And that's what we reinforce in our, our regular professional development. That's happening at the schools as well, of course. So once we're trained, OK, what are we going to do with that information? Uh, I got together with the grade level teams for, uh, for the elementary social studies. And we were looking for informational and literary text, uh, historical fiction a lot of times, that combined social studies content and that we could develop Common Core uh, applications from. We also look for other teacher support materials as well, things like uh, Lucy Calkins' Units of Study, which focuses on opinion, narrative, and informational writing, helping teachers develop those. Uh, anybody teaching elementary school knows all about Lucy Calkins. Uh, we also uh, got trade crates for teachers that like the trade crates. Uh, you know about the six plus one traits. So if you're a uh, developing writer, you can take a look at ideas, organization, voice, word choice, sentence, fluency, conventions, uh, and then presentation or publication. So that's the six plus one traits. Uh, we got materials to help the teachers with that as well. What does it look like? Well, what you see here, uh, these are our fourth grade uh, packets that we put together. And uh, I'm not sure, but there's one down here by Mr. Sheriff. So uh, a lot of Michigan history in here. Uh, wonderful, wonderful books. A combination of uh, fiction and nonfiction, so informational text and literature. And this is what each school would receive for the fourth grade. Uh, there's a, a, a bucket for each school there. So um, one packet for each school for each of the fourth grade teachers to share. And this will be done for each grade level for each school. Uh, those were mostly Michigan history books. Here are some examples of some of the American history uh, pieces, some uh, great biographies, the Patchwork Path, which is a wonderful book about the Underground Railroad. And here's some more kind of international perspective books, Me on the Map, uh, which is a great book about map skills and geography. It's fun, right? Uh, and then these, I, I love these three books over here because they really take a look at an international perspective and how are we the same around the world and how are we different around the world. Uh, the one down in the corner here, everybody bakes bread around the world. A lot of people bake bread, but they do it in different ways. So how are we the same and different? On the same day in March, takes a look at weather around the world, and kids are fascinated by this book. You know, each page is a different part of the world. You get to the back of the book, and there's a map. shows you where all the places are, and it, it starts some great conversations. And this is the way we go to school, in different places in the world, again, looking at ways that were similar and ways that were different. Uh, <coughs> you see how creative our teachers are. You saw that tonight. 
Uh, there's a million ways they can go with any one of these resources, uh, much less all. So these are just some examples of what we're sending out. Once the teachers have those materials, what are we doing with them? Uh, really, the idea is that we're, gonna, we're reviewing those materials, we're developing the libraries, we've done that for each of the grade levels, and now we're developing sample assignments, how we're going to use them, how we're going to implement it to both teach the social studies concepts and also the reading and writing concepts that the Common Core calls up, upon us to do. And one of the things that uh, when I talk with other educators, other teachers, what the, we really like about the Common Core is the focus on higher order thinking skills, leading to the kind of presentation you saw tonight you know, on the IB art. But being able, it's not just about the who and the what, but it's the how and the why. You know, why does this matter? What does this tell you? What do you think about this? What can you predict will happen next? Much higher order thinking skills. So what might this look like? Here's an example from uh, uh, using one of the resources that we purchased called Next Spring and Oriole, which is a book by Gloria Whalen. And it's a book about uh, a young girl and her family. In fact, it opens up, she says, my name is Elizabeth Mitchell. I'm called Libby. On my 10th birthday, April 3, 1837, my mama and papa and I left the state of Virginia and everyone we loved. There's the story at its beginning. Now it's 1837, they were headed to another state far away that had just become a state that had deep woods and they found it very intimidating. So which state do you think they were headed to? Minnesota, Minnesota Wisconsin. Michigan? Michigan. They were headed to Michigan, indeed. 1837, <laughs> Michigan became, no one told you to be a test right? All right, no more questions, I promise. But 1837, Michigan became a state. So they were headed to Michigan. So now we have an opportunity to talk about what was Michigan like in 1837? What was everything like in 1837? And I'm not going to take you through all the steps that a teacher would go through with the students because we don't necessarily have time for that tonight. But here's some facts about life in the 1830s. We get some good social studies applications here, right? Most Americans, most working Americans lived on farms or in small towns. You know, the fastest things that most Americans knew was a racehorse, right? I mean, you know, it's a different kind of perspective. Uh, no electricity and central heating, of course. Most clothes were stitched by hand. You know, you had one Sunday's best outfit that had to last, right? Uh, characteristics of historical fiction. Uh, a teacher would point this out to the students as well. It's all the elements of a story, which they're talking about in their classes. It's realistic, it's set in the past, hence historical fiction. Uh, there'll be many details about what life was like at that time. And, and many other things, which again, I'm not gonna go through all of that, but what I did want to point out was we were talking about social studies before, now we're talking about the literature piece. Now we're talking about historical fiction, applying those, in, uh, in this case, literature skills, but using social studies to do it. More social studies skills, uh, this is what map of what the United States looked like in 1837, right towards the end of Andrew, Andrew Jackson's presidency, right? So uh, Tennessee uh, is towards, towards the western edge of the country uh, where he was from. Texas is an independent country uh, between Mexico and the United States, and uh, everything else west of that is somewhat under dispute, depending on your perspective. Uh, more social studies skills, what was Michigan like at that time? And the book talks about early Native American trails through what became uh, eventually the entire state of Michigan. So we're learning about that. And of course, the idea of deep Michigan forest, you know, the, uh, most of the state was covered by forests. It's a very different challenge to get from one place to another. How do you do that? Well, we learn about that in the book. Timelines are also very important social studies. Also another good way to apply writing. Remember we talked about different types of writing. It's not just a 10 page paper or at the elementary level, you know, maybe it's a, a five paragraph essay, but it is giving lots of information in a short writing. A timeline, for example, does that. So a teacher may have uh, his or her students stop and think about uh, how different diseases may impact the Potawatomi or the uh, American settlers uh, from, that were coming from the East Coast. Uh, they might talk about what it was like when the two different societies interacted. Learning about early uh, American uh, cultures is a big part of what we teach about in social studies, but now we can teach about it using uh, literature as well. May have students do journal writing. Again, a, a less formal way of writing, but they have to think about concepts at depth. And uh, just some examples of many different questions that teacher may ask. There's one other example I, I wanted to share real quickly with you and then I'll open it up for questions. Uh, I was in a, an elementary classroom the other day and we were taking a look at informational text uh, based on paragraphs. So paragraphs of information, five to seven sentences, 
rich with content about a social studies topic. And then we ask the students to summarize. Okay, tell me about that paragraph in 12 words or less. And it was fascinating to watch. At first, of course, it was a bit of a challenge. We did it together at first, but uh, to summarize, we're not used to saying less. We're used to saying more, right? Uh, as I try to wrap up here. Uh, so they, they had to come up with a summary in 12 words or less. And then it was interesting to watch as they went through the other paragraphs, their summary started to get shorter, but they were spot on. We talked about when you summarize, you're looking for the main idea. So you have to interpret those five to seven paragraphs. What is the main idea? Yes, there's interest in detail, but what's the most important fact? Or what's, the, what's the theme of that paragraph? And what can you learn from that? And how can you summarize that in 12 words and six words and however many words? Uh, it's a different way of thinking about the content that they're reading. So it's not just plowing through it, but it's interpreting it and understanding it to a deeper level. Uh, just one of the many ways that our teachers are working to apply the Common Core standards at the elementary level and using social studies to do it. So that's it. Real quick, wow. to the point. So any questions about that? Fascinating. Questions? Yeah. Where are we in the design phase of the sample assignment? Yeah, we're towards the end. Uh, at this point, there, a number of assignments have already been developed. I just shared ideas about two of them with you. We have almost all the content here. We're still waiting on a couple of the kindergarten pieces, but most of it's here already. And I'm hopeful that after the uh, next professional development session, we'll have all the assignments completed, and we'll be able to distribute everything out to the schools. And then, of course, the goal would be to you know, add piece by piece to this as the years go by as well. But all this is driven by what our teachers are looking for. You know, it was the need that we saw for informational text came from the teachers, and the solutions have, have been driven by the teachers themselves once we train them in the common course. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I, I do have a question. Yeah. I, I, know that, uh, I know that there's been preparation for a number of years to rolling out the common core. Sure. And I think I've, as of recently, that's sorted out, and we're going full steam ahead, if I understand correctly, as far as Michigan. Goes. So, um, overall, um, we've done some of the training, but with the with the PD days, th that's being well received. I'm sure there's a lot of eagerness to finally go forward. I think so. I think you know it was confusing. You know, great best. So that was that, I think that was frustrating for everybody, uh -huh. and and just confusing for everybody. But mm -hmm. when push comes to shove, you know, I in 18 years of. of being an educator, working with teachers, and working with students, I've never come across a teacher said, you know, you know what I want? I just really want to spend more time on intricate detail and minutia with my kids and forget about those big important concepts. You know? I mean, there are facts and figures our students need to know, and we're going to drill those home. You know, when was the War of 1812? But an even better question, <laughs> but an even better question is why did it happen, right? And and what happened as a result of it? You know, it was really the continuation and the ultimate end of the Revolutionary War. You know, where was the last place in the war? Uh, when would, where was the last place in the United States that foreign troops were stationed? You can't answer this because we were talking about this earlier. But it was Mackinac City. Uh, British troops stayed in Mackinac City two years after the War of 1812. Well, why? How did that happen? How was it allowed? These are all, why did the British want to stay there? These are really important questions. And, and being able to spend more time on the how and the why, uh, still have those important topics that we need to cover. But the reality is, you know, how many of us we walk around with a phone in our pocket and our purse, and it's an encyclopedia set right there, right? And when we can find the facts, what do we do with them? You know, what do you do with somebody on TV telling you something? Do you just assume that it's true because they said so and they're on TV, so it must be true? <laughs> yeah. Well, that can be a really confusing way to go through life, can't it? So uh, it's neat that we're able to help students think about the world around them and, and, and develop those higher order thinking skills while they're learning social studies and art and science and math. That's very important, right? So uh, we're excited about moving forward with that. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think that there's a lot of benefits towards um, having some common elements to the curriculum in a very mobile society. Maybe that's not national just yet, but there's a lot of people that do move job changes, whatever. So I see a lot of good in that, yeah, having a standard. Right. Any others? Any others? Just a comment that yeah. what, you, what you're saying, Scott, with just the approach of reading and writing, I think is similar to what we just heard from our art students, what we hear from our elementary <coughs> teachers. <coughs> you know, that's the way of, of um, learning now, and I think there's it's no exciting and much more relative, relevant to our students as well as our and teachers. And there's a lot of crossover, and you talked about this before, there's a lot of crossover between IB, uh, whether you're talking about PYP, MYP, or DP and the Common Core. You know, you heard it when the students were talking about their artwork, 
And you heard it when the kindergarten teachers were talking about what they're doing with their students. You know, it really is, uh, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, okay. Scott. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate everybody, all the crews that came out tonight. Yeah. Very much so. Good. It's very educational for us. So we'll move on to curriculum instruction <coughs> and understand Lynn has a, a curriculum committee meeting in this. Yes, we met on November 25th at Midland High School. And our meeting started with project-based learning and Jeff Flower and Penny Miller Nelson gave a brief presentation on project-based learning. 37 teachers were involved in the PBL training this summer. Next, Melissa Toner, the MHS psychology teacher, was part of this training and has been able to use her project with her class already this year. Ms. Toner and four of her students described the project in its various steps what the experience was like, and gave feedback on what they learned along with the pros and cons of this particular project. While this type of learning experience was relatively new to all involved, everyone considered it to be very successful in helping students learn and retain the psychology concepts and use 21st century learning skills. Christy Gayhart, K-12 science teacher leader, followed with a discussion of her experience with PBL and a business partnership model. Christy, along with a second Midland Public School teacher, worked with Mid Michigan Health in developing a PBL activity from the healthcare field that tied in directly to the science curriculum. Project based learning and business community partnerships are natural extensions of each other. Next, uh, Jeff Lauer, our career development and physical education health administrator, presented the Midland Public School Sex Education Biannual Report. Public Act 165 of 2004 requires a report be given every two years to the Board of Education regarding the attainment of program goals and objectives in the area of sex education. Our goal is to educate and impact student behavior regarding sexual activity, pregnancy, and the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. As our measures of success, we aim for 100% of students to pass topics for teens and health wellness classes with a grade of C or better and we aim to reduce the number of, of teenage pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases in Midland County. The latter data is only available as a county. Mr. Lauer reported that the number of student, students earning a C or better had reached 100% in the last two years and that the countywide numbers on teenage pregnancies and STDs has fluctuated but are generally in the same range. And lastly, uh, we had a quarterly update on focus schools. The state of Michigan requires any school designated as a focus school to provide a quarterly report to the Board of Education regarding their progress on the school, focus school requirements and closing the achievement gap. Janet Greif, principal of Midland High School, presented her school's quarterly report. Ms. Greif reported on the superintendent's dropout challenge, Midland High's teaching and learning priorities to address the achievement gap, improvement activities during this quarter, and progress in reducing the achievement gap. Midland High's full quarterly report, along with those from Dow High School, Carpenter Street School, and Northeast Middle School, will be in uh, Superintendent Cheryl's Friday letter to board members, which we all have received. And there is no meeting this month, and we will meet again in January. Any questions tonight? Seeing none, we'll move over to, to Mr. Cooper. I have for your actions tonight the major change proposals, which I first brought you on November 11th. Um, what these are, of course, is if they're accepted, the changes get incorporated into the student enrollment processes and procedures for 2014-15. And of course, upon approval, the implementation of these changes will be dependent on the budget. As a quick reminder, they're listed in your agenda, but there were three of them, uh, one in world language with a point level change. Uh, one in contemporary business, which was an alteration uh, with a name change, a little bit of a grade level change, and also an attempt at uh, blended learning on that one online. Mm -hmm. And the last one was uh, computer technology one and two, where they were uh, doing an addition of a point three option to provide extended opportunities for students. Okay. Um, time to ask for a motion and take a vote on accepting these proposals. I have a motion. So move to accept these three proposals. Support. Moved by 
by Vice President Baker, support by Treasurer Brandstad. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, move into a voice vote. All in favor of the change proposed say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thanks, Bob. We'll move to finance and my understanding our treasurer has a FFO <coughs> study committee minutes to report. I do, and can you make sure that, can they hear me? My mic is actually red for batteries, so I don't know if they can hear me or not. I'll talk loud, okay? All right. You want a microphone? So, we met on December 3rd and we continued our tour of different buildings. This time we went to one of our um, district's newest buildings, Dow High School, although it is actually approaching the half century mark. So um, we took an entire tour, um, places that most people never get a chance to see. And there are outdated facilities and systems that make the building costly to operate and provide less than optimal instructional opportunities. There is a need to bring the entire mechanical system, art rooms, the little theater, and science labs up to 21st century standards. Um, there are approximately $8 million in repairs and improvements that have been identified for the building earlier this year in preparation for um, the sinking fund elections that we had um, last spring. Following the tour, representatives of the High School Athletic Booster Clubs described their plan to create a joint project fund at the Midland Community Foundation that can be used for improvements to the high school athletic facilities. So they are calling their group SPIFI, which stands for Sports Improvement Facility Fund for Youth. Um, it would be started with contributions of $2,500 from each booster club. They would then promote the fundraising efforts at sporting events and tournaments and actively seek donations and grants. The first projects to be funded would be concessions, restroom, storage, and a baseball press box and field work at Dow High School, a baseball press box and seating, and a softball press box at Midland High School, and swimming platforms and blocks to be used by both schools. The first phase of projects was identified as having the greatest potential <coughs> for not only addressing immediate athletic needs, but also for making the facilities attractive to outside groups whose rental fees would help offset the cost of maintenance. Mrs. Klein gave a brief update on fall 2013 enrollment. For the first time in many years, the actual enrollment fell well below all projections, including the lowest estimated created by Stanford Consultants. Fall enrollment dropped by 301 full-time equivalents. This is 133 more than was budgeted, or less than was budgeted, however you want to look at that. An examination of entry and withdrawal patterns between the February and October count days indicated nothing out of the norm. And our next meeting will be determined in the new year. <coughs> Any Thank questions you. or comments of our treasurer? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to Linda. Yes, we have five gifts this evening. Four of them require no action. They total $5,820. The donors are, there's, there's two gifts for Dow High School, one from the United Church of Christ and one from the Athletic Booster Club. Uh, we have a gift from the Siebert Elementary PTO and then an anonymous donor gave a gift to the district to support the IV primary years program, which leads us into the large gift or grant, which will require your action this evening. And this is from the Rollin M. Gerstacker Foundation in the amount of $180,000 to support the IV primary years program. Wonderful. We'd like the honor of uh, making a motion to accept that wonderful gift. I motion to <laughs> accept that <laughs> gift from the Gerstacker Foundation for $180,000. Moved by Member Singer. Support? Support. Support by Treasurer Brandstad. How appropriate. Um, any questions or comments on that? I'll make one. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, to the Gerstacker Foundation and the other foundations who have helped support this effort. And uh, I think it really helps differentiate our district, but even more importantly, provides opportunities for kids they wouldn't have had otherwise. And thank you for those startup monies to make that happen. Yeah. Any others? Well, and thank you to everyone that put in so much hard work to get to this point, point. and it'll be exciting to see how it goes forward. Yes. And, and I just think it's amazing to see that the, the IB program that we've had for a number of years 
is able to progress because <coughs> what I understand that <coughs> excuse me there's a lot of schools that have started out with the high school program progressed to the primary year program it's just a natural evolution it's I think it's a good fit for the district so uh, all in favor of accepting that wonderful donation say aye aye, aye. opposed unanimously passes thank you very much to the Gerstecker Foundation um, you'll see the le list of correspondence to and from the district in the agenda you'll also notice our future meetings the first meeting in January is our organizational meeting and just for a refresher please do the organizational meetings in July when the terms for the board were July to July uh, we now do it January <coughs> since the terms of the board are January to January uh, leading right into 9.1 the committee has uh, done a review for the uh, officer slate. We're not prepared to announce it this evening. I'd like to review it with individual board members a little bit before to make sure everybody's comfortable with what uh, we may be recommending for themselves, <laughs> for the other members. So uh, we'll be, you will know what that is before the end of the year and the new board, which takes place January 1st, which is everybody here. Uh, we'll vote on that at the first organizational meeting when it comes to. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to hearing from board members. Uh, I'll start. Well, I started with you last time, didn't I? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I'll start with Angela's time. All right. You know. What? Mm -hmm. So I do need this. <coughs> okay. <laughs> I actually want to take a chance just to elaborate on something I read in the FFO minutes, and it was the um, booster clubs that came in and talked <coughs> to us at FFO. And I just want to express how much I appreciate groups in our community and um, parents who do this type of thing. These people actually saw a need, saw that the booster clubs themselves probably couldn't in and of themselves provide what they saw and they have stepped up and put a lot of work into developing this um, foundation that they're gonna have at the Midland Community Out Foundation and I just wanna thank them for all the time that they have put in to put this together and just express how much I appreciate them doing that. And that, that would be it for tonight. Okay, on to me already. Okay. Okay, uh, a few things to, um, uh, to reflect on. And actually, one of the things that I was going to mention was uh, the group Spiffy that realized the need in the community and how that is uh, modeled after Tune Up and other successful uh, projects that the community has come together using the collective uh, um, um, resources of the community. And what was really interesting about that is that you may not have up and down the block in, uh, in uh, most streets in Midland school kids. So you may not have as many parents to organize and be able to work in the booster club. What I really, really liked about this program is that this can appeal to the community, those that may want to give to the community foundation. They may have a broader interest and support in the community for um, high school athletics. And I think it's really neat because it does appeal to maybe a, a slightly different group in the community. Uh, instead of the same group of the parents and so forth of the booster clubs. Uh, so I thought that was very, very uh, original and unique. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the strategic planning uh, that we had because I think it is nice. I know Superintendent Sh uh, Shara was going to get mo that information out and uh, the newspaper did do some coverage as well. But it really was nice to take uh, a big picture look at the district and where things are going. Um, some of the good things, some of the things that we need to work on. Um, the student achievement was, was, uh, has maintained and to the credit of our teachers and our, our administrators making that happen. Um, the theme that resounded again and again is that the best people that we have for the district uh, are in our district. And uh, we did talk about the future of learning. Mr. Shaw started out with that and I thought that was really neat. Uh, and in particular, looking at the most recent uh, report from the Board of Education that looked at how um, there may be more and more incentives to look in the direction of uh, doing um, blended learning, uh, using online resources and so forth. And it really is, a, is a, um, sort of the writings on the wall as far as needing to change and how we just deliver uh, instruction. And I, I think we have some of the best people to do that. Um, so I was, I was encouraged and um, but also it's, it's good to share that with the community where we need to go and things we need to do. Um, next on my list was I appreciate the iPad presentation. It really is nice seeing the future. Um, we are incrementally inching forward that we don't have a lot of resources as far as our, our technology, but we're doing the best we can with what we have and we're gathering longitudinal data to find out when we do to get those opportunities down the road to be able to implement that and have uh, teachers with some experience. And so I think that time does help out. Um, I was impressed with the IBR presentation and, and the kids. You guys are just amazing. The teachers also as well. Um, I'm really impressed. 
Um, one thing I was going to bring up is uh, uh, MPS really shined in the robotics tournament um, at uh, Freeland High School and Middle School. Uh, there was six MPS robotics teams at elementary and middle school level. Out of those six teams, four of them went to the state competition, and that's going to be coming up in the middle of December. And the top scoring robotics team in this whole tournament of 30-some uh, robotics teams, some of which work months and months to prepare, and they've been using uh, years and years of, of uh, keeping teams together, going from the elementary level starting out at fourth grade, first at fourth grade rather, and going up to eighth grade where they sort of cap out with their experience. The top scoring team was a, a team from uh, Northeast Middle School, and they totally rocked it. I mean, they were just amazing. Um, so um, it was really neat uh, as a parent to be involved with that and to see kids that are so well prepared with our teachers and, and our, our, um, our, our school staff um, that you can put them up, they do a presentation, they're able to use a laptop computer and program a robot, um, they're able to go into a classroom and have a team activity and they're judged on their collaboration and their teamwork skills. They have no idea what that activity is. They have to think on their feet and it's really amazing to see elementary kids and middle school kids perform to that level. And you have, you have actually real live engineers, as I told the kids uh, from Next Year Automotive, real engineers judging the kids and inspiring them. Real live engineers <laughs> for Next Year, uh, one next of the sponsors. Yep. Real live engineers. <laughs> uh, and, and so the, the thing is, is that to take the skills that they learn to be able to work as a team, collaborate, and be able to come up with solutions to things where the, the solution doesn't exist and to, to problems. It really was amazing, so I think MPS really shine. I think Mr. Sharrow has it in as a communique, which is really neat uh, to those teams. Go on to. Thanks, Yvonne. And yep. thanks for all you do for the robotics. I tell you what, it's great. Yvonne. Well, I was just thinking back over the year and um, some of the accomplishments, some of the highlights, some of the things that really stood out for me. And just going all the way back, I think it was in January when Judge Allen was here and talked about um, the efforts that the uh, uh, administration and the teachers were making with her at East Lawn and attacking the uh, absenteeism there and then not too much later we learned that they had a day did they have perfect attendance or was it like two they actually had a perfect attendance day i think that's amazing what they did there and then i thought of the uh, teachers at chestnut hill and uh, principal renfro and how they were you know we're a focus school and in a very short period of time became a reward school and then of course there's um, mr fox and his computer science students, his uh, programming students, who went to a competition and did really well, a competition where high school students had never been before, had never competed. How amazing. And then, of course, tonight, the presentations we had, and of course, I missed a lot of, I, you know, I'm working with a middle-aged memory here, but um, <laughs> just, just some really amazing things have happened over the course of the year, really amazing things. And so I just have to say I'm really happy always to be part of this board and to just really hear all these things and see them happening. Then I also want to say that um, I think it's, it, was, it was a fast year somehow. It went by really quick. I can't believe it's the end of the year already. But um, it was a good year and we had some challenges along the way, but we welcomed Mike Sherrill and that was a good thing. And I, the last thing I want to say is that I think that the challenges that we did face, I think we weathered them really well. And I credit you with that, Jerry, because I think without your excellent leadership we would not have done nearly as well. I thank you. I learned a tremendous D ditto that. lot of things yeah. from you this yes. year and I really appreciate all the help you gave me and your leadership. I just think it was amazing. I'm taking it back. Thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's all I have. Oh and I just want to wish everybody happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I just would like to congratulate our shining stars again tonight. It's always uh, wonderful to acknowledge people that do those things behind the scenes that we don't all see every day that uh, make us the great district that we are and, and so that we can accomplish all the wonderful things we hear about every week. And um, our uh, art students and, your t and the teachers, it's always amazing. I'm excited to go over and, and look at the art after the meeting here. You do tremendous work and I would I hope you uh, all have very successful futures. And uh, our kindergarten, you go to the other end, it's just amazing to me what kindergarten has become and what, what students do from just a few years ago. It just, uh, I, I don't know, I, I would, don't know that it would be passed very easy, as one of the teachers was saying there. You know, these kids know far more than we do. So uh, thank you for all that, that they uh, are doing over at Woodcrest and all our other buildings with uh, technology. And then we've talked a lot about 
writing and journaling and how it really is, is integrating all across the curriculum. And I, I have three letters here I have yet to read in an, their entirety from some students at Northeast. And uh, so I will be getting back to you, Chloe, Emma, Nicole, Madison, Brendan, and Daniel. They have some ideas on lockers and dress codes and school themes. So they are using their, their skills to communicate with us. And then I, I, I think lastly, um, as I've been in the buildings for some different events, you're seeing Christmas trees, you're seeing f um, food donations, gift donations, and once again we see the generosity of our families and our students and staff in, in Midland and um, sharing, that, sharing the Christmas spirit with each other. So on that note, I'd say Merry Christmas and I hope everyone enjoys their vacation and we'll see you in, in January. Very good. Um, we talk a lot about impacting academic achievement um, and the thing I think about tonight is with the IB program with the art students as well as uh, with a lot of the other classes in our PYP program. And I think forward as well to what can we do different as a board to help continue these great programs and help accelerate our academic uh, successes. And I think about um, the technology and um, <clears throat> specifically how if we can get technology in the hands of kids like our kindergartners tonight um, where they can have that in 24 hours a day and how it can really uh, impact their success and extend their learning to their time at home as well as at school. I'm also uh, interested to look more at ways to impact academic success by looking at the school calendar. We talked a little bit about that with our uh, strategic planning. And I think it's interesting to me to see <clears throat> how much is lost over the summer times, especially in our elementary school age kids. So it'll be fun over these next couple months to really start thinking about other opportunities that we might be able to take advantage to really help our kids find success. Um, John, you mentioned all the teachers and, and the success of the robotics program. And I think that's great. And uh, one thing that I think that program has too is a strong parent component. And without our <clears throat> parents in the backing up our students and our teachers, uh, we wouldn't be as strong. So a big thank you to the parents out there who are helping the kids with, with that part as well. And I guess in the next year, if we could do more to collaborate with parents and help bring them on to uh, strengthen our education and our, our academic achievements, I think that's uh, another way that, that we might find to um, give us a boost in that direction. Big thank you to all the donors and uh, every meeting we've got um, great donations coming in that really help our district uh, stand out and do some great things and and uh, it's wonderful to have that kind of support in the community so thank you. And my comments are more along Yvonne's. Um, <coughs> it was very I thought it was great that we sat down especially with the relative inexperience of our board in terms of where we're at of just kind of getting a level set of what the world is out there. We don't get to do that at our operational board meetings. And the next steps Mike and I are talking about, what do we do for next steps in terms of how do we take that information as a board and as a community to figure out what do we need to drive going forward to Pam's points of differentiation. Um, and in, the, in those sessions we heard, as in any organizations, great results that are happening, challenges that are ahead, and that's going to happen at any point in time for any organization in any endeavor. Uh, maybe they're a little more challenging for us, maybe not, uh, but we'll figure those out. But what was fascinating was those meetings and tonight's meeting, it took me, this was a real microcosm of our district. We sat there and, you know, first thing Mike does is recognize people for doing, I, I hate to call them little things, but the little details that make the difference. 
that they didn't have to do. And it's just typical of what our people do. You know, people are here tonight, people for your nights, our teachers every day. Um, we, we, we talk about our IBR. My gosh, you know, well, how fantastic. And you sit there and go, where else can, can kids in this area get that? It, it's truly unique and, and very strong. We, we, and on the other extreme, we go to our kindergartners and, and, and we're starting to experiment with technology and, and you can see what a boost that's gonna be to their educational achievement. And an extracurricular, we hear about Spiffy and we've always had the music parents doing tuning up in their other programs that, that come from the community to support the extracurricular basis for our kids. And then, then the, the startup money from our foundations to bring IB, both at high school historically and now recently, at the other extreme, the PYP. I look at all of that and I just say, why wouldn't you want to go to school here? Why wouldn't you want to be part of this? And it, that's, that stuff is not new. It's a continuing tradition of doing those things and I'm very confident that condition, that tradition will continue into the future. And, and with that, Mike, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we expect you to lead us into that future, and I'm very confident you will. So, so uh, it's been a good year, and it's going to be greater years going forward. I'll turn it to you. I have one last group I want to recognize with all the people we've done tonight. Um, most of you know of a program um, started by the United Way in our county called Sharing Tree Program. Yes. And in, in the Midland Public Schools, um, a few people make that happen, and there's a lot of work there going on behind the scenes. And I want to recognize Tracy Renfro, who is the building coordinator for that, Wendy Cooper, Deanna Jewell, Colleen Smith, Lynn Burns, Doug Bradford, Roxanne. Hopefully, Roxanne, we've, forgive me on her name, Weezen, Greg Hawkins, Sue Story, Beth Chapman, Joanne Coates, and Tammy. Domchesky. These volunteers um, um, located 400 gifts um, or had 400 gifts given to us and are going to be distributed to Middle Public Schools families to the United Way program. So, quite accomplishment there. And the um, last piece I wanted to touch on with you was our community leaders luncheon we had last week in regards to the renewal of our operating millage known as the Enhancement Millage. And um, we had a good meeting with several community leaders in regards to that and um, some ideas going forward um, where we'll, we'll be out working that election in the next few months because they they really got the message how vital it was in fact they they said uh, we need to begin to say uh, without that what would happen without that enhancement millage and it's pretty obvious that um, today as I wrote in my money communique without that enhancement millage we run out of funds in two years and, and people need to know that going forward and so we have to have that renewal coming February 25th that's all I have. Anything else for the order? If not, we stand adjourned.